Good afternoon slash evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Dreadnoughts 101. So a Dreadnought is a capital class ship. Each race and also some of the other factions have a Dreadnought available. The Mimitar Dreadnought is the Naglfar, which we'll be talking about a little more in depth today than the other ones. But to briefly go over the different types, the variations depend on what skills you have, because you require racial skills up to that point for basic battlecruiser and battleship 3. So all of the Minmatar capital ships require hydrogen isotopes as their fuel. This is the fuel they use to use their jump drives to jump themselves across star systems. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But each of the main four racial types have different fuel requirements. So Minmatar is hydrogen isotopes. The Galente Capitals require oxygen isotopes, and these are ice products you get from mining ice, different types of ice in different regions. Amar Capital ships require helium isotopes, and the Kaldari Capital ships require nitrogen isotopes. It also goes for their jump freighter for that, each racial class as well. So Dreadnoughts are the damage dealers. They're the highest damage dealing of the regular capitals. They deal a lot more damage compared to freight, um, carriers against other capital targets, other big targets. Carriers is a separate class, but they generally do better with fighters against smaller targets. But dreads have the big guns and the big drone gun bonuses for damage. So before we talk about the specifics for the Naglfar, we'll talk a little more about capitals in general. cool thing about capital ships is they can they have jump drives they can jump themselves to sinos avoiding all stargates in between now they're limited by certain ranges and skills that affect that range like jump drive calibration for capital jump drives but there's a certain number of light years that your ship can move by jumping to a sinos so it under attributes and let me check what the base for the naglfar is So Naglfars have a base jump range of 3.5 light years, which if you train JDC5, Jump Drive Calibration 5, that doubles up to 7 light years. You've probably never seen light years measured before in EVE, that's because they only really apply to capital ships. The in-game map, if you have the new one, is actually in 3D. You're generally looking at a top-down or expanded 2D like Dotland. But there's actually a Z dimension to all the systems in the game, and the distances straight between those systems are what's calculated for light year distances. So if you're sitting in your capital ship right now and you open the map, you'll see kind of a big gray pancake or light white pancake uh, centered on your ship. That's your jump range. So you can see all the systems that are within range and some of those that were without. You can also use Dotland. Dotland super useful for checking capital jump drive ranges and planning your routes. Jumping capital ships is infinitely safer than taking them through stargates. Gating capitals of any kind at any time is generally the fastest way to lose a capital ship because they can easily get caught. Whereas you can jump um, from tether to tether basically. And you can immediately dock depending on the type of structure you land at. So capitals are the biggest ships in the game. They do have docking restrictions. Let me check my notes here. For example, Dreadnoughts, and this is the reason why Fortisars are so important. Dreads cannot dock in an Astrohus. They can only dock in a Fortisar or equivalent size or larger structure. So Dreads have to sit on Tether for an Astrohus or a Vitaru or an Athenor. They're unable to dock inside them and log off safely. They can still log off on Tether. That's what our Titans do on our Fortisar occasionally. But being able to dock your ship is very important. That's why Fortisars are at capital level structures. If you're a meaningful alliance, you need a Fortisar to dock your carriers and your dreadnoughts and your faxes in. In order to jump a capital ship, you must have a target destination Sino. There are a couple different types of Sino. There's the most common hard Sino, as it's called, or maybe sometimes called, which can only be lit, well, not only lit, but can be lit on Force Recon T2 cruisers, the cloaky ones. That's the most common way you'll move capitals around, is to have someone with a Force Recon light a hard sign up for you, a regular sign up. 
Also, it is possible for a Blobs battleship to light a hard Zyno, but it's a terrible idea. There are also now deployable Sino beacons. These are one-time-use deployable little structures you can launch from other ships that can carry them, as long as they have cargo space. They have a couple minutes anchoring timer, and then they're in space with an active Sino for about one hour. And anybody in that same fleet as the person who dropped the beacon can jump to it. There's also the anchored Sovereignty Flex Structure Sino Beacon proper. It's a flex structure like an Ansiblex and a Sino Jammer. The Sino Beacon provides a continuous Sino to any ship based on access lists. So back during the big war in Delve, there was a problem where we, people, both sides would put up bait beacons. They'd make them public to anybody and name them very similar to the other Alliance beacon names. And if you weren't careful, you could jump to what ended up being a, a trap beacon placed by a hostile name, something you think in one of your access lists. So always be very careful jumping to beacons. Make sure you have eyes there or just don't do it at all, given the choice. Because Brandon beacons are does beacons. have a bait beacon and pure blind. There you go. Yep. These bait beacons, even in friendly systems, Sino beacon, or low Sino beacons have to be placed away from structures. So you have to warp over to a structure to be safe. And you're super vulnerable because capitals take a very long time to warp, like 30 seconds. Let me take my own fitting here. My skills, I've got, yeah, 30 second online time for this dreadnought, which is insane compared to any subcat. In order to jump to a Sino, you have to have both enough fuel in your ship's fuel bay of the correct type or the distance. Fuel requirements are based on, can be reduced by skills, jump drive, fuel conservation is the skill. And it's based on how many light years you're traveling, how much fuel you're going to use. The fits I handed out have 10,000 isotopes, which should be plenty for, I'm going to light a sign on just next door, very short jump. So yeah, the base capacitor requirement is 95% of your capacitor, which is very big. That's reduced also by skill, I think, jump drive operation skill, down to about 71% or so with level 5. So when you arrive at system, your capacitor is very low at a small percentage. If you're jumping into combat, it's important that you immediately cap up with cap boosters, and we'll practice that here in a little bit. Speaking of, I need to turn my other character in so I can get the sign-out going for you guys. If you are ready in your capital ship, please undock from the keep star. So I can see who's ready. And we're stay on be, each other for now. Are we going to be using any siege modules? Yes, this will be a life, life fire practice, so make sure your fit has a siege module and also ammo for the guns. And my second question is, where do we put the strontium for the siege? In fuel, fuel bay? Fuel bay. It also, I think it also bay. works from a, from a uh, fleet cargo. Yeah, it works in your regular cargo, the default, or the fuel bay. I don't think it pulls from the fleet hangar. We'll talk about that in a second more. Oh, might as well talk about it now. So the defining attribute for the dreadnought is the siege module. I linked it there in fleet chat. The siege module only goes on dreadnoughts. It requires strontium clathrates to activate and consumes a certain number per cycle, reduced by skills. When you activate the Siege module, it has a 5 minute cycle time, and it locks you in place for those 5 minutes. You are unable to warp off or change your velocity in any way, unable to tether, and unable to dock for the full 5 minutes while the Siege is running. However, there are many benefits to having it active. The first one, of course, is the huge bonus to your damage. You can look at the attribute stats if you want to check them out. You get a huge boost to your guns or missiles if you're um, Phoenix, for example. You also get a massive boost to your local um, active tank. So while the Dread is in Siege, they're stuck, but they're super powerful and dangerous. Another effect of the Siege module is it massively multiplies your mass by 10, which is why it's important for you to not be moving when you hit the button. If you are moving, you're going to keep moving, basically, and you're going to drift, essentially. 
the inertia. Because how it works is if you're already moving, like if you bump off a sino, other capital ship or structure, and you hit the siege module when you're going really fast, your rate of slowing down is dramatically reduced compared to normally. So you're going to keep drifting at that speed for a while. That's why it's important whenever you come through a sino for a dread or with a dread bomb, especially on bigger capital fleets, because there's a possibility when the models spawn next to each other at the same point, they can collide with each other. This can cause spectacular bumps sometimes, like a couple thousand meters per second, which is very bad for a capital. It can send you shooting off into space. It's important that you double check you're holding still and not bumping, or if you are, trying to recorrect that before you engage your siege module. Because you can drift surprisingly far in five minutes. That can put you out of range for your guns, especially if you're short range fit. Most dreads are bomb fit. What that means is anti-capital short range guns. That's the highest damage. And they're also usually buffer fit, which means like these example fits, capital shield extenders and resistance modules. It's important to be flag exempt for most fleet operations because there's always a chance that a spy will take command or a squad leader position in a capital fleet and try to fleet warp you away. So this is more a thing for super capitals because they're a lot more valuable. But any capital, if they do get warped off where they're supposed to be, it's usually to their death, and there's no way they can stop it once it happens. So capital ships generally warp themselves. The FC will always be very clear where you're supposed to be going or moving or not moving. So avoiding fleet warps is the best way to keep individual capitals safe from being taken to the wrong place. To do this in your fleet window, click on the top left corner where there's a hamburger menu for fleet actions if you hover over it the three or four white lines horizontally in a square. And then check the, well, I'm the commander so it doesn't show. There's an option for flag exempt or flag accept fleet warp. Oh, there it is, I found it. This will give you those little three star icon or whatever it is in the menu, on the list, fleet member list. So you can see who is and who is not accepting or exempting from fleet warps. So most of you have it exempt, very good. So the other way to fit a bomb, dreads mostly, they're generally either bomb fit, which is anti-capital short range buffer, or haw fit. And what that means, haw stands for high angle weapons. Those are the anti-subcap capital dread guns with good, much better tracking that can hit smaller targets like battleships. Haw dreads are generally used in smaller numbers on smaller engagements, or if they know there's not gonna be a hostile capital response. And they're generally active tank fit with active shield repairs because they're operating solo against subcap fleet DPS. So like most capital ships, the Naglfar is a dreadnought, has what's called a ship maintenance bay, separate cargo bay, of 1 million M3. This allows you to put assembled, fully assembled ships inside it up to 1 million cubic meters. Now there's a restriction on what you can be inside the ships that are themselves inside the ship maintenance bay. It can only be ammunition or charges. So you can't have any modules, I don't think any drones in ship cargo. There can be drones in the ship's drone bay, but not the regular cargo. And no extra fuel or anything. So cap charges, ammunition, nanite repair paste can be inside the ship's cargo. Again, put inside your ship maintenance bay. This is generally used as a suitcase function. Um, I know during the last few move ops over the months and over the few years, people will load up their capital ships with their subcaps. They don't want to rip the rigs off because you can have the fully assembled ships with valuable rigs in the ship maintenance bay. You can carry them with you as you jump across systems. You also have an extra fleet hanger. This is in addition to your regular cargo hanger, but it's called a fleet hanger because it can be available for fleet members to access. It's 10,000 meters M3, which is great for other storage. But also if you want to give access to fleet members, there's an option in your inventory window, two little buttons. You can enable it to fleet members or to court members. You can toggle them on or off green or kind of pale blue. This allows other fleet members or court members who are next to your ship on within 2,500 meters, like same looting a cargo ship, accessing the ship hangar 2,500 meters. They can put things into or out of the fleet hangar from their own ship's cargo. And this also acts, gives them a fitting service. 
they can refit those ships from your ship's capital fleet hangar. So whereas normally you'd need a mobile depot to reship or refit your subcap out in space, if there's a friendly capital next to you and they open their fleet hangar, you can refit from their fleet hangar. And also you have a separate fuel bay. The fits I gave out had the hydrogen isotopes in the cargo bay because there was enough space. But you can put them in the fuel bay. If you, if you needed more fuel, you put them there. It's 8,000 M3 for dreadnoughts, or for the Nagelfar, because that's also where you put your strontium clathrates generally, because strontium is a very large volume compared to hydrogen isotopes for fuel. Even just one cycle of stront for your siege module takes up 750 M3, or at least for me it does, the baseline 250. So you're going to need the larger M3 of the fuel bay to have more strontium for multiple cycles. And you go for, a, the general rule is about 10 cycles max, that's 50 minutes. If the fight is still going after 50 minutes in a dread, that's that's an exception to the that's an unusual situation. Ten cycles is plenty for most situations. So if you can fit ten cycles worth of the strat, you're good. When you're fitting capitals properly, kind of to the gills, getting ready to go out into a fight, fitting space gets a little tighter. That's where you make use of the fleet uh, fleet hanger, because you can put extra things in the fleet hanger because they can take anything like regular cargo. Then as the fight progresses, if you run out of strat in your fuel bay, you can move it from your fleet hangar or to your cargo or cap charges or something like that. So before we go, please double check you have at least 10,000 hydrogen isotopes if you're a Nagelfar or equivalent fuel type for other capitals like the Phoenix. You need at least 10,000 just as a baseline. We're only going one jump very 10, short range. It shouldn't even take that much. Okay. If you wanted to check, we're going to go next door to JTAC GAMP. There's a way you can verify your fuel consumption before you jump. If you right click on your ship's capacitor and click on open jump navigation, not jump to, open jump navigation right above it, left click. That'll give you a new window with a list of all systems you can jump to. The distance there are away in light years, whether or not it's in range, a little info about the system, what security it is and the fuel it will take for you to get there based on your skills. Question. Mm -hmm. So these already have Sino beacons in these systems because it says, says in the type Sino beacon. Yep, that's the first splash page when you load it up. Those are existing Sino beacons with access probably set public. Okay. If you click on the second tab at the top to within range, and then sort it by distance for light years. That'll show you the closest nearby systems. Yes, your jump fuel conservation skill will reduce the amount your capital spends. I think it's 10% per level. Okay, now we're all gonna jump to the same Sino in the same fleet, because we have to be in the same fleet as the Sino in order to jump to it. I put some seizing fleets out on my other character, Arthur Winterson, he's gonna be the Sino. If you right-click your ship's capacitor right now and hover, hover all over the jump to, you'll see several beacons. Those are your options that you can jump your ship to right now. After I light the Sino and the other system, you're going to see an option for Fleet Sino, Rather Winterson. Okay, I've lit the Sino on the other character. When you right click your capacitor, you should now see an option for Jump to Fleet Sino, Rather Winterson, JTEC JMP standard. Everyone, please jump to that by left clicking on it. We should get a pretty sound effect. And your capacitor is now about 25% or less. Yes. Most of us are holding still. There are a few of us who are bumping. If you are bumping, hit control space on your keyboard to slow down. And possibly even reapproach the sign out. That also helps accelerate you in the other direction you want to go. Oh, I got a good bump there. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Perfect. That's in like 6, half and easy. Anybody like to volunteer to lead the second fleet for a little fight here? Sure, I will. What? So those of you who are still in Herald's fleet should now see everyone else has listed as neutral. That's custom overview settings for NPSI, so they're not in the fleet. They appear as neutral. So you can practice shooting otherwise blues on the combat tab. Now, every capital ship should have a capacitor booster of some kind, either heavy or capital. 
If you didn't already, like I forgot to, make sure you load it with Catbooster 3200s. And if you didn't already, start capping up by chugging your boosters. This will get your capacitor up to a higher level. This is important whenever you land from a jump into combat to start capping up as soon as possible because there's a risk of yourself getting capped out by newts and also just being able to jump out again at a moment's notice because you need the full capacitor level to jump. You can right click your ship when you're in it and click on show info and then go to the attributes tab. The attributes will be adjusted based on your current skills with the green numbers. You can scroll down and see how much capacitor your skills work would require. Kind of down at the bottom, okay. jump drive capacitor need, it'll show a percent. Okay, so as bomb dreads, you're going to want short range ammo. The ones I handed out included those with the fit. These are the short range ammo types for projectile turrets. They are, what's loaded here, Republic Fleet EMP, which is EM damage. And then also Republic Fleet because they're higher damage. So EMP, Fusion, and Phase Plasma are the highest damage close range types for EM, explosive, and thermal damage respectively. It's not so important for this fight, but in general, you want to pick a damage type based on if you're able to know what capitals you're fighting. Generally, shield tank ships have an EM hole, and generally armor ships have an explosive hole, but competent fitting will fix those holes and even overfill them. So sometimes thermal is the best bet. It depends on the situation. But everyone, I want you to please activate your siege module. Activate any shield hardeners you have for extra tank. And you can begin free firing on people not in your fleet. Now, I intentionally didn't specify a... Um, specific target, and you'll notice that spreading out DPS like this is very ineffective. My fleet switch all damage to James Talon and Nigelfire. Focus fire, just like main fleet, is important for dread fleet to focus them down. I forgot to talk about the emergency hole energizer module. If you have that, if you activate that when you're in low shields, it makes you invulnerable for a few seconds. So James, if you have that, activate it now. It's a low slot like a damage control. This will give you super resistance for your art structure hit points for about 10 seconds. All right, James is dead. Go free fire now. We'll spread it out. So you can see against in range targets of their other capital ships, dreads deal huge amounts of damage. Like I'm dealing that shot with 6,000 to somebody. Six and a half thousand damage per cycle, and the guns are cycling very quickly. Also, keep capping up if you aren't already at full capacitor. If you're running a heavy cap booster like my fit was, you only get one thirty-two hundred charge per cycle. You have to wait for it to reload and then chug it again. So even if you only have enough fuel for one cycle, your siege modules should be green if you haven't touched it again. That means it's going to recycle if it has enough fuel at the end of the cycle. If an engagement is coming to an end, the FC will say, the FC will call the Siege Green or Siege Red. Calling Siege Red means you click on the Siege module once. Everyone please do that now. This will deactivate the cycle at the end of its current cycle and avoid starting another one. This is important so that the FC can coordinate when people are coming in and out of Siege. So the whole fleet is you know, in Siege and fighting or out of Siege and ready to escape and jump away. Any questions so far about the dreadnought? Uh, just generally, what's like, what each, uh, where each dreadnought is better at? Like, what are the, like general differences? When would you ever use a, a phoenix, for example? So the main differences between the dreadnoughts are their weapon systems that they're bonused for, and their tanking abilities. So the Naglfar was popular for a long time in Brave, and still is because of its capitalist guns and damage type selection for ammunition. So also, it has a decent buffer tank as well. But some situations on capital engagements, if there are lots of newts on the field, capital newts, being able to still shoot without capacitor is one of the strong points of the Naglfar. However, also like the Phoenix, Phoenix also has capitalist missiles. 
the Phoenix has a much stronger active tanking ability compared to the Naglfar. Better shield stats and resistances, I think. So the Naglfar does get a bonus to active tanking. So you can active tank a Nag. Shield boost recycle time reduction, yep. The Phoenix has bonuses for shield resistances. There it is. So it can tank even better for shields as buffer or active, depending on skills. And they have the option for super long range capital cruise missiles, which can be used for B-52s to pause citadels outside of their targeting range. The Revelation is great because it's a super armor tank. It has the armor resistances and really good stats. So you can make excellent um, bomb faxes out of Revelations because they have really good hit points. But they're also locked in damage type because they use lasers and they require capacitor for lasers. So they can only deal EM and thermal damage, but they also do, they do have very high damage and good application at range, thanks to their Tech 2 crystals if you have Tech 2 gun options. Okay, so I am out of Siege, because I red cycled it when I told everyone else to. My guns are now doing a tiny, tiny fraction of the damage they were before, even though there are still dreads on field. But, because I only had enough strontium in my cargo to run for one cycle, let me just double check here. Yep, I do not have enough to recycle it. I'm going to try, though. And I get an error message saying requires a ship to be loaded with strontium clathrates to perform this function. Yeah, it's a five minute cycle time. Can't jump, can't warp, can't dock, can't tether. Also, big one, cannot receive any outside reps. Even if there were friendly faxes on grid or other friendly logi, or even hostile logi, nothing can rep you while you're in siege. There's no point shooting guns in a dread without siege running. Yeah, caps got expensive on the real server. They used to be relatively cheap and easy to make. Thanks to the industry changes, they're now, you know, four and a half, five billion plus for just for the whole and the basic fit. So would you say dreads are the simplest of capitals to fly other than a jump freighter? I mean, I'm talking about combat ships at least. Yeah, that's a very solid assertion you can make. I'd agree with that. Dreads are the simplest, most straightforward. They're also the most in demand to have. Uh, number one priority if you're an aspiring cap pilot in Brave is the dreadnought because they have the ability to kill other capitals more than anyone else that's not a super capital. So if there ever is a capital versus capital engagement that Brave is going to participate in in the near future, we need to have as many dreads as possible if we're going to take that fight and win that fight. That's how, one, we kill other caps, and two, we counter their cap escalation. Because in EVE it's always an endless game for the capitals of escalation. Okay, they drop a few capitals, okay, we drop a few dreads to kill them. They drop a few more dreads to kill our dreads. We drop, you know, even more dreads to kill those dreads. They drop supers. We drop a bazillion dreads or supers. They drop titans. You know, it escalates. There's always that risk of other groups as well coming in to fight. But dreads are the baseline and the kind of the backbone of any capital fleet. Dreads are SRP able, right? Yes, and I'll mention that now. If you want to fly dread and brave, you have to join the brave capital group. I think you only need the basic skill plan trained and either the money or a hull. And then once you're vetted and uh, um, invited, you'll get the doctrine fits on the wiki. If your doctrine fit and you undock the dread and lose it in a fight that was pinged for and run by a um, proper FC, like skirmish FCs can't call for capitals. You have to be a strat up FC, I think, or a full FC. I don't know what the difference is, or a cap FC. There's only a couple people who can do that who can call for capitals. But then you would get SRP if you lose it, yes. Morgan, if it's Doctrine Fit, yes, you get SRP for it. Yeah, let me talk a little bit more about the Emergency Hull Energizer. I forgot to do that before we started fighting. This is a rather critical part of Dread Fights. Because in larger numbers, you'll die very quickly from concentrated fire from multiple hostile Dreads. This replaces your damage control. It gives you much less resistance, or I think zero resistance even normally. But the Capital Emergency Hull Energizer works kind of like an uh, Assault Damage Control. It gives you massive 95% hull damage resistances for your structure, but only for a few seconds. Activation time for T1 is 14 seconds. That makes you unkillable for 14 seconds, which in a big dread blob will potentially double your lifespan. That's the difference. T2 gives you 2.5 seconds more for activation time. Everything else is the same. Costs you a little more CPU, too. But because dreads will die so quickly in these huge dread fights when they do happen, 
even 10 seconds, 14 seconds, 16 seconds makes a difference to your lifetime and the damage you can keep applying. It's important you hit it when you're in low shield or even half shield, depending on how big the fight is, because you can get volleyed through. I, from my own personal experience, there was a small dread fight in catch in days past. And I was watching my shield go down. I was getting primaried by the hostile dread fleet and also the hostile subcat fleet. And I saw 30% shields and I thought, oh, I can go a little lower. You know, I don't want to waste this. And then all the dread volleys landed at the same time and poop, I died. So anywhere below 50% is a good time to activate because even though you lose a few seconds while they're still going through your shields, it's better to do that and get, make sure you're invulnerable to avoid being volleyed through 30% of your shields all the way through your structure and armor, which are basically nothing compared to your shields. For a buffer network, knuckle far at least. After you use the module, it does burn out. So even if everybody stops shooting you when they see you're invulnerable in structure, once if they go back to shooting you, you lose the option to use it again. It just stays burned out. You have to dock up and repair it in order to use it again. So I guess in a longer engagement, it's not uncommon for them to target you again, to target people twice, right? Because of that. Yeah, it depends on what the uh, hostile FC, how he likes to run the cadence for target calling and the timing and numbers involved. Some FCs will just say, keep shooting the same target until he dies, because they know it's going to run out in a few seconds. Others will try to quickly switch to a different target and then come back to the same target 10 seconds later to kill it, because they know the EHE has run out. So how do faxes come into this? Like in a, in a dread v dread brawl, do faxes like actually have enough ripping power to, to, to get through that? Or? So because dreads are unreppable while they're in siege, faxes have no part in the dreads themselves. However, if the dreads are killing something bigger like a super, that's when faxes come in to try to save the super capital. I see. This covers my topic for the basic dreadnought um, notes. Any questions? Thank you, man. Yeah, that was awesome. So if somebody in your fleet um, lights a Sino, is it also possible to jump to them from the watch list rather than through the capacitor? It is. That's I correct. That's that is an option you can do. OK. And would that be like a safer option in general? or? It is. So if you want to be safe, you know, use the watch list. That's the recommended way to do it. If you're comfortable, you know you're not going to misclick, you can use the capacitor, but there's always the risk. I don't know, your finger slips and you go somewhere else and then you die. So watch list is always safer, that's for sure. Got it. Thank you. You are most welcome. If you want to stick around, I'll be running carriers in a few minutes. That sounds fun. Thanks, Harold. Have a good one.